Mark 12, 38 to 44. As he taught, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance, say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two copper coins, which were worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Good morning. morning. You know, most of us know, culturally speaking, in most North American households, we learn fairly early on not to speak of religion, money, or politics in polite company, right? (laughs) We're smart. We, We know not to do that in this culture. I think it's fair to say that our guest preacher this morning never got the memo. (laughs) The Reverend Dr. Deborah J. Mumford is the daughter of the Reverend J. A. Mumford and Ms. Hazel B. Mumford. She grew up in North Carolina. She attended Howard University in Washington, D.C., where she earned a Bachelor of Science degree, like most of us, in mechanical engineering. (laughs) And it was then she began to feel a call on her life. In 1994, she answered that call to ministry and studied both social work and theology, the latter at the American Baptist Seminary of the West. She served as the director of recruitment for two ATS seminaries, the Pacific School of Religion and the American Baptist Seminary of the West, both in Berkeley, California. Dr. Mumford earned a Master of of Arts in Biblical Languages degree and a PhD in homiletics and New Testament from the Graduate uh, Theological Union in Berkeley. She currently serves as the Frank H. Caldwell Professor of Homiletics at the Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. She's the author of numerous books, articles. I want to especially lift up uh, the book that she uh, wrote a few years ago, Wealth, I'm sorry, Exploring Prosperity Preaching, Biblical Health, Wealth, and Wisdom in which she assesses the history and theology of the Word of Faith movement, and in a beautiful way, in a very pastoral way, refuses to do which, which, that which many of us do with uh, academic knowledge. We, we tend to weaponize it against those who don't uh, agree with us. In a beautifully pastoral way, uh, Dr. Mumford uh, uses the wisdom that she has gained through participant observation, observing numerous worship services, and even enrolling in a biblical interpretation correspondence course to better understand how word of faith pastors were taught to exegete. Her book is highly regarded as a practical guide to a growing phenomenon in U.S. religiosity today. Dr. Mumford is an ordained minister of the American Baptist churches, and she comes to us this morning as a preacher and as a pastor. She will encourage you. She will inspire you. And Lord of mercy, she will challenge you. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Mumford. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Hunter, for that introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> so let us uh, look at the text. And before I get started, I want to say a few words about how I got started on working uh, or critiquing prosperity gospel. I, my father is actually a prosperity preacher. (laughs) I'll just let that sit just for a moment. (laughs) And I'm a critic of prosperity gospel. Uh, But but I came to research prosperity gospel because my brother uh, became a member of a prosperity congregation in uh, Goldsboro, North Carolina. And when he and his family were members of that congregation, uh, what happened was that the pastor, so prosperity preaching, I wanna make sure we're on the same page, 
is a type of gospel where, where preachers preach that God promises all of God's people that they can be rich according to North American capitalistic standards. <laughs> just to be clear, right? Um, and also God promises through God's word, their interpretation of the Bible, that adherents of, of the gospel can also enjoy very good personal health, if not perfect physical health. So those promises are what attracts people to this movement. So when we talk about prosperity preaching, my brother was part of a prosperity church in Goldsboro, and the pastor continually asked the people who were serving under him for more and more money. Tithes were not enough, it would seem. Uh, continually asked for offerings, and they were required uh, by him to give offerings on demand whenever he wanted a little bit more money for whatever he wanted money for, uh, especially if they were officers of the church like my brother was, they were required to give more and more money. So pretty soon my brother got tired of that uh, and his family left, but I was intrigued by his experience and I wanted to write something that could serve as a guide for people who, who were caught up in those congregations, especially if they wanted to get out of those congregations. So that's how I got into uh, Prosperity Gospel. But I'd like to thank Al Tizone for inviting me to come. I've spent the last couple of days getting to know you, having conversations, and they have been rich. And I praise God for all of the work that you're doing all over the world. Now, when I think about this text, this, is, this text is the widow's might. And prosperity preachers, oh, they love, they love this text. <laughs> God, they say that God promises uh, you know, all believers that they can be rich, and they contend that this particular woman is a model of faithful stewardship. Well, I disagree with that particular interpretation of this text. But before we go delve even deeper into the text, I want to talk a little bit about where prosperity preaching comes from and some of its core tenets. Does that sound like a pretty good plan? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I like that. All right. <laughs> okay. So when we um, think about, when we talk about prosperity preaching, uh, the core theology of the movement was developed by a man named Essek William Kenyon. And he was an evangelist and Bible teacher who had roots in Methodism. And he lived uh, in the late uh, 19th century and the beginning of the uh, tw 20th century. He drew upon the holiness movement and Pentecostalism and new thought metaphysics to develop his theology. And when I talk about new thought metaphysics, many of you are familiar that what I mean by that is a philosophy, philosophy in which people are taught that they can change the circumstances of their lives by changing their thinking, right? So if you find yourself in a chaotic world, uh, world and the situations and circumstances that you don't like, all you have to do to change that, they say, according to New Thought Metaphysics, is to change the way you're thinking, right? And all will be well with you. Isn't that wonderful? See, you're probably all doing it wrong. Huh? <laughs> so he also taught his followers about positive confession. So words shape your reality. And so members are not only to verbalize positive affirmations. So even to, uh, uh, something such as a simple question like, how are you doing? Even if you're feeling horrible, like you are sick and you are barely standing up. They say you should say, I am well. I am good. I am blessed and highly favored of the Lord. You hear some people say that in prosperity preaching churches. Right? So you should never admit, even if you're struggling, don't tell people that. Don't allow that to come across your lips because the words you speak shape your reality. Okay? Um, there's also... Another person who uh, is part of the movement, and his name is Kenneth Hagen Sr. Now, Kenneth Hagen actually, shall we say, co-opted 
No, let's, let's make it plain. He plagiarized <laughs> Kenyon's theology. And there's a book by a man named Dan McConnell in which he puts the words of Kenyon and Hagen side by side, and they lived about 50 years apart, and they're word for word in many of them. When he confronted with this, Hagen said it was just the moving of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Absolutely. So Kenneth Hagen is known as the father of the Word of Faith movement. So he took Kenyon's theology and made a movement out of it, a movement that has become known as prosperity gospel. Uh, but he did something that is genius. Now, if you are starting a movement, you should also start a school to create disciples of your movement so that long after you are gone, there are people being trained in your particular way of thinking, of your theology, and he's done that. More than 23,000 people have graduated from Rama Bible Training Center. That's just genius, don't you think? <laughs> it is. Um, but he also did something also very well. He used media very effectively to get the message out into the world, something that mainline Protestant churches don't always do very well. And I, I can talk about us badly. Uh, but he used radio and he used television. And even today, some uh, churches in the Word of Faith movement have latched on to social media and use it so very effectively. So Hagen um, uh, was the father of the, the movement. But another important person in the movement is also a man named <laughs> Oral Roberts. Now, Oral Roberts, uh, you may know him as the founder and chancellor of Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, he also had roots in the United Methodist Church. What is with all these Methodists? <laughs> in the Word of Faith movement. Uh, so what he also did was he, he authored the uh, Seed Faith Doctrine. Some of you have heard of this. Uh, it is the principle of sowing and reaping. There is a parable of the sower that we find in the Bible, and he's taken this and he's developed a doctrine. And so the doctrine is that when believers sow seed of any kind, such as time and talent, love, compassion, but especially, especially money, no, you got to sow the money. Um, then God will give you those things back. And not just the same way you gave them, but multiply back to you. All right? So by giving seed money to God, believers are blessed by having the money multiplied back. And he also uses Luke 6, 38 as a text, give, and it will be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Some of you are familiar with that text as well. So when we, let's go back to the text, right? And so prosperity preachers claim that Jesus is offering this widow up as a model of faithful stewardship because she gave, because she believed that God would take those last two coins that she was offering and multiply those coins back to her. So she didn't have to worry about food or clothing or shelter or the fact that she didn't have any money left over. Because she, she gave in faith, God would bless her and supply all of her need, needs, maybe even more abundantly than she could ask or think. I don't believe that's what Jesus is saying here, right? I believe there is something more going on in this text. So we should try to figure out, you know, what's really going on in the text. If we look at this text, we can see clearly that Jesus is critiquing the actions of key members of the religious establishment, especially the scribes in this text. Scribes were experts in the law of Moses. They preserved and defended the law. They lectured on the law in the temple and they served as judges on the council or the, what is known as the Sanhedrin. And sometimes they managed the assets of widows. In the Greco-Roman world, it was believed that a woman needed the wisdom of men, and sometimes in some circles that is still the case. Um, they needed the wisdom of men to make decisions about their finances. And so the scribes stepped into that role and, and served that role for the, 
for the women to help them use their assets so they can live long, long after their husbands have died. So Jesus was saying in this text that the scribes who were given the fiduciary responsibility of managing the assets of these widows were in essence stealing from the widows. They were taking those assets that were left by the widow's husbands and using them for their own gain. And Jesus was, was highlighting that fact. You see, there, there, this, this one uh, is one of many times in the text where Jesus highlighted the corruption of religious leaders in, in, in the Greco-Roman world. But I believe there's Jesus doing something even deeper than that. I believe Jesus was also critiquing all of the systems and structures in, in place in the Greco-Roman world that made an entire class of people poor. Let's look at this little chart. Um, if we look at this, and is there a yeah, mic? There you go. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, if we look at this chart, uh, what we'll find is there, this is the Greco-Roman socioeconomic hierarchy. Uh, at the top, of course, is the emperors, and you have Roman officials, you have merchants and priests and landowners. The biggest piece of this is the people of the land, uh, the slaves, the peasants, the common people, the everyday people. At the bottom of this chart is what we call the expendables. And these, uh, these are people who, according to Jewish law, were the unclean. These were the deaf, the crippled, the people who were marginalized and put outside the community because they were unclean. So if we look at this chart, what we find is that about 80% of the people in the Greco-Roman world were the, pe were the common people, the slaves, the peasants. But I wanted to outline it this way because this 80% actually supported the upper 50% by their labor and by the taxes they generated for the Greco-Roman society. So the lifestyle of the rich and famous in this uh, scenario were supported on the backs of these common people. But I want us to take the time to look at uh, how that system actually worked. So if we uh, look at this chart, what we find um, is that uh, looking at the 80%, first at the top of it, uh, we find the Roman emperor. Emperors had absolute power. They controlled the Senate and the tribunes, and they served as the commander in chief of the military and managed all of the finances. Um, and to make the bureaucracy run very efficiently, they taxed everybody who was living in the empire. And so as you can imagine, uh, the Roman emperors garnered a, 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 an abundance of wealth during their day. But at the same time, the emperors had the power to choose other leaders. And the emperor put in place those, those pe people who are known as Herods, the Herods. We know in the Bible the days of Herod the king, that's very familiar, who served as king of the Jews and tetrarchs in parts of the Roman uh, Empire. So if they wanted to keep their jobs, these people who had been elected by Roman officials, they had to do two very important things. First, pledge their undying and unwavering loyalty to the emperor, but then they also had to show the emperor the money. Collect the money, have a, a continuous flow of money. For they, they don't care where it came from, just make sure that they collected the money for the empire to sustain uh, itself, itself across uh, all of its territories. So the Herods, then, they chose tax collectors. And we know, know when we're reading the Bible that the tax collectors were people like Zacchaeus. Who, who went around and sometimes they charged people more than they should, uh, and that's why they were also hated by many people in the empire. So if we look at this whole system, then we see that the wealthy in, in the Bible um, also 
And uh, some of the people in the temple, some of the wealthy were merchants and landowners and also the priests. Priests who were part of the temple were landowners and sometimes they had slaves who worked their land. And they uh, told the land, but the priests lived off of the proceeds of the land. So you can see how all of this upper 15% survived off of the backs of the slaves, the peasants, and the common people. So all of this 80% worked hard, and much of the money that was, they made was taken away from them to support the lifestyles of the few. In your work of mission, it is important to understand the systems and the structures that sometimes keep some people poor while also making others rich. The ability to sit down and just look at the systems, what is happening here? There are some places all over the world where there is such dire poverty, there must be something afoot, some things in place that keep some people from uh, uh, at just living into the reign of God the way that God would want them to. So the ability to do that is something I believe that we should all have, but I challenge you as people in the mission to work together to some, sometimes and somehow analyze what is really going on. But also, I want to take up that same chart with prosperity preaching. Now, I know in any church, it takes money to run a church, right? So it takes money for programs, it takes money for uh, staff, it takes money for ministries, and, and, and all of the wonderful things we want to do to bring about the kingdom of God on this earth. And at the same time, I must critique uh, churches that preach prosperity preaching I believe sometimes take advantage of the people uh, who are poor. So it, it, as, um, if we look at, at this particular chart, uh, we can see that there are donations of the congregation that support the staff and the programs and ministries and also the lifestyle of the pastor. Now this gets especially egregious when the people who are giving the money for the ministries are poor, living in dire poverty, not sure how they're gonna make it from one day to the next. If in some cases we've heard of people just giving so much of their money, half of their income, a third of their income to the church, money that they need for uh, survival. And they do this because of a theology that teaches them that by giving, God is gonna give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, running over, more than they put in to that. This theology, I believe, is dangerous, but it can also be life-threatening for people who find themselves in dire poverty. So one of the reasons I like to highlight what's going on in prosperity preaching, especially to people who are engaged in ministries all over the world, and sometimes with people who find themselves in dire poverty, is that you need to understand what the theology is, how to recognize it, and, and we'll continue, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how to combat that, okay? So if and when uh, giving uh, of some people in the congregation is used to support the affluent lifestyles of the pastors, oh, I believe that is very wrong. And that is not what God wants us to do. In some uh, prosperity preaching congregations, people in the church are funding private jets. In some prosperity preaching congregations, the church are, uh, p people in the church are funding mansions. In some prosperity preaching congregations, uh, the church are, uh, people in the church are funding expensive cars. And I believe that every uh, laborer is worth her or his hire, don't get me wrong. I believe that pastors should be able to make a good living. 
But I also believe that the money that, that people give to further the work of the kingdom of God should not be lived uh, to use to live lavish lifestyles. I don't believe God wants that to happen. And so one of the things I want to also highlight is that there are a few other teachings of prosperity preaching that I think can be obstacles to uh, mission partnering that you may do with people all over the world. And I want to highlight just a few of those things. Um, so, so let's talk about those. Four teachings that I think that can be obstacles to working with other people and partnering in mission are a teaching that one, Jesus was not poor and the poor are cursed. Two, race doesn't really matter. Three, if you are not healed, it's because of your lack of faith. And four, that living by the word of God eliminates all social ills. Right, that would be nice, right? <laughs> That would be awesome, but let's, um, let's, let's talk about, so here's a quote from one prosperity preacher, if you walk in poverty, then you don't look like Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you are not familiar with Creflo Dollar? Oh, okay, let me, let me see. Okay, so Creflo Dollar, is a pastor in Atlanta, Georgia, of a congregation of uh, more than 20,000 people, primarily African American, but his ministry, uh, he has a television ministry that reaches literally millions of people. Um, and so that is his actual name, Creflo Dollar. Um, it's, it's an interesting story was that was uh, when he was trying to decide, he wanted to go into ministry, and when he was just trying to decide, you know, what, what, what type of ministry that he wanted to go into, he got a visit from a, another man named Kenneth Copeland. Some of you know Kenneth Copeland? And he convinced Creflo Dollar, he got that name, my brother, right? So prosperity preaching is just a natural fit for you. And so Creflo Dollar is now a prominent prosperity preaching pastor in Atlanta, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. So, uh, so yes, he said if you walk in poverty, then you don't look like Jesus. So now they must argue, you have to understand that if, th they must argue if they contend that God wants you to be rich and God promises you that if you live according to the word of God that you will be rich, they must argue that the, the cornerstone of the Christian faith was not poor. They have to make that argument. They don't make it well, but they have to make that. They have to make that argument. They argue that Jesus had enough of everything. He actually had a treasurer, so of course, of course, he had money. But if we kind of think about the damage that it can do to someone's image if they hear this coming across the pulpit, if you walk in poverty, then you don't look like Jesus. What that does is that ignore, ignores any systems, any structures that happen to put the people into poverty in the first place. So that is dangerous teaching. So there's also a teaching, this is another quote by another prosperity preacher named uh, Bill Winston, who has a ministry uh, in uh, Illinois there is no sickness that Jesus will not heal if you have enough faith. Wow. Right. <laughs> yes. So imagine how damaging this can be. If someone who, who is faithful in the church, who has been a, attending the church for a very long time, if they happen to get a disease like <coughs> cancer, which many people get, then according to prosperity preaching, then you to, God wants to heal you. And if you have enough faith, you can be healed. But some at their extreme also, also teach that if you have enough faith, you shouldn't need a doctor. God will heal you miraculously if you have enough faith. So what happens is this teaching is putting all of the onus on the person. 
So if they don't get healed, then they are failed Christians, right? And so what does that do to someone's faith? If they don't get healed, or if they're praying for a family member who doesn't get healed, then they believe there's something wrong with them. And that is another reason I believe prosperity preaching is particularly dangerous. Now, there's also another teaching. Um, and, it's, and, and some prosperity preachers say that race, race, right? Race doesn't matter anymore. Once you accept, or we accept Christ as our personal savior, we are no longer burdened by our natural heritage, they say, or things like race. You don't have to worry about race and issues of race and everything that comes with it because born again Christians have a new spiritual heritage. And racism is no longer an issue because we can create our own realities. How much sense does that make? Really? Again, this is a dangerous teaching because some people think that they now they're new creatures in Christ Jesus, then they won't encounter the racism that some people who are outside of the Christian church encounter. And they, they are in for a rude awakening, right? The same racism that was there before they accepted Christ is still there after they accept Christ. So this is another teaching of um, the gospel. One more. Uh, they say um, that living by the word of God eliminates all social ills. That would be wonderful. By that they mean that it, if the whole world were converted to Christianity, then all the social ills would disappear. And I ask, have they ever worked in a church? <laughs> right? We know that's not quite true. Right? Because the saints of God are more than a notion. Is that right? <laughs> so when we um, talk about that, so, so what now? So these are some tenets of prosperity gospel. What do we do with that? Um, uh, so one of the things I want to say, uh, how do we combat it when you're out there in the world uh, doing missions? One thing I say is that biblical interpretation is key. Prosperity preachers get their messages by proof texting. So they take text out of context. And you know when you take any verse out of its context, you can make it say anything. And so by helping people understand that in order to truly understand the word of God and what's being said in any particular passage in the Bible, they need to take the whole context into consideration. And by helping people do that, that, that can help uh, that can go a long way to helping to combat some of this really horrible theology. Um, but there's also, when we think about this, and this is something I talk about in the book quite a bit, that sometimes when we encounter people uh, who have been part of prosperity preaching churches, they may have a broken faith. Their experiences may have left them uh, so broken that they really are wondering if they want a relationship with God anymore. And you can understand that, especially if they've had a family member, for instance, who died, uh, may have died of, uh, of a disease, and they prayed for that person to be healed, and that person was not healed. And maybe they were ostracized by their congregation because they didn't have enough faith to have their family member healed. They can be broken. Uh, so I say that we should help people to reconstruct their faith. And when I say that, what I mean is that reconstructing faith is acknowledging that maybe, uh, that actually, Jesus was poor. Let's just look at the text. And according to the socioeconomic uh, uh, standards of the day, and though he was poor, he was not cursed. And the poor in our day are, are not, not cursed. Now, we can argue that poverty in and of itself is a curse, right? That uh, when people don't have enough food and clothing and shelter and educational opportunities, that that is indeed a curse. But it is one that can be combated if we work together with other people to combat the systems and structures that keep 
people hungry or keep people outside of education institutions that could provide them with opportunities. You see, while some poor may bear responsibility for economic situations, I know I've not always made the best decisions in my life. We've all made mistakes. But, but that does not mean that, that, that the poor, are, are, are many of the poor find themselves in situations and, 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 and caught up in systems beyond their control. So also reconstructing faith means believing that God is, yeah, sure, God is able to heal. We know that God is able to heal. But, but there are faithful people who have not been healed of disease. And that does not make them faithless. Right? Amen. Is that, the, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So some people uh, have uh, experienced uh, so many disease, cancer, and all of that, and they've been faithful. They've done what God has called them to do. But for some reason, they were not healed. They are still children of God and still need, need to be treated with dignity and respect. But they also, people in prosperity preaching churches also need to know that God does not just heal miraculously. God actually uses doctors, nurses, the healthcare system. God uses psychiatrists, therapists for mental health care. God uses physical therapists for physical therapy. I know I've had several uh, uh, sessions of physical therapy. God uses all kinds of people to heal uh, in our world. And, and for prosperity preaching, preachers to say that God only heals in one way, that is problematic to say the least, right? Reconstructing faith all, also means that in a perfect world, yeah, race wouldn't matter. We would all love to live in a world where it doesn't matter, where wherever you're from, whatever your ethnic identity, whatever your race, uh, whatever your gender, whatever your gender identity, identity, it just wouldn't matter because we are all children of God, created in the image of God, and deserve to be loved by the people of God. That would be an ideal world, but that's not the world we live in. <laughs> So people who are a part of prosperity preaching churches need to live in this reality. And they need to understand that in, they, we all need to work together to combat those systems uh, that keep people of particular races or ethnicities or other categories that we, we d discriminate by, uh, keep them down and keep them from uh, experiencing the full reign of God. So as you go out into your world and, 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 and do the missions that God is calling you to do, I want you to keep an eye out for um, those communities where prosperity preaching is being proliferated. And my prayer is that uh, you are able to work with other people in the community to let people understand that God loves them unconditionally. They don't have to give to receive uh, a, a, a particular amount from God. They can just be the people God created them to be and be loved by God and the people of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.